approach to a patient of orthostatic hypertension, we'll also be doing some autonomic testing in a patient where the first thing that we're going to do is a heart rate variation with deep breathing. That breathing would here imply vagus nerve would come into picture. So we'll have to do a couple of practice runs and the number of breaths that we'll be finally ensuring that the patient takes in one minute would be six breaths per minute. As far as the FVC of the patient is concerned, we need to achieve a value of about 1.5 liters. So it requires a bit of practice. And then I'm just giving you some normal ranges. You don't need to remember that. But the variation of the heart rate in a younger patient who is usually less than or about 20 years of age, the variation of the heart rate is in the range of about 15 to 20 beats per minute. If you compare this with the older patient, let me say older than 60 years of age, then the variation of the heart rate would be only about 5 to 8 beats per minute. It varies on the basis of age and this statistical charts which are available for it. But the bottom line is that this variation which is a normal phenomenon would be affected in a person who's having dysautonomia. Then we're going to talk about Velsawa response. I am going to talk about Velsawa ratio also, but at the moment, let's look at the four phases of Velsawa response and also check out what happens in these phases with respect to blood pressure and the heart rate. You don't need to remember the value for the heart rate because uh, whatever arrow that I will put for blood pressure, the heart rate value will always be opposite of it. Like you know it from your physiology that suppose if the BP is increasing, the baroreceptor drive would kick in and that will decrease the heart rate of an individual. If I say opposite, if I say that the blood pressure of the patient is falling, the, refer, the opposite would be happening, the, card, the baroreceptor drive would be downgraded and therefore the heart rate of the person will increase. So you don't need to remember the direction of arrows with respect to the heart rate per se. It will always be opposite. The only exception to this would be with respect to the late phase. In fact, instead of writing A and B, I can write in a different way, early part. E here means the early part of phase 2 and N here means the late part uh, late part of uh, when our response. So let's look at it, what happens initially. You are asking the patient to breathe out. Uh, it's, a, it's a forced breathing against a closed glottis against a pressure of about 40 millimeter of mercury. So when the person will be trying to forcibly breathe out, then there would be increase in the intrathoracic pressure. This increase in the intrathoracic pressure will contribute to compression of the aorta. I repeat again, you have instructed the patient to breathe out against a closed glottis. The pressure against which he is breathing out is about 40 millimeters of mercury. So you can put it on yourself. If you are trying to breathe out against a resistance, then your intrathoracic pressure will tend to increase because you are trying to breathe out against a resistance. And therefore, due to compression of the aorta, the blood pressure will tend to slightly increase. Once the blood pressure tends to increase, the opposite will happen for the heart rate because the bare receptor drive would kick in. Let's look at what happens a little later with respect to phase 2 of Vensava response where now intrathoracic pressure is increasing, increasing, increasing. Earlier I was saying it was it is squeezing the aorta. Now it will start compressing on the venous return. I repeat my statement. In phase 1, initially, when you were breathing out, the pressure was in the aorta, so it was causing a slight increase in pressure. But now, as the pressure increases further in the chest, it will crush the veins in the chest. Uh, when I'm saying crushing, it's it's in, not in a literal sense that it is causing a complete... Uh, in, or he's, uh, I do not imply that there's a complete interruption of blood supply to the heart. All I'm implying is there will be a reduction in the blood supply to the heart because the intrathoracic pressure is increasing and is decreasing the venous return. If the venous return will become less, the BP will also become less and therefore the heart rate of the patient will exhibit an opposite response. When it comes to the late part of phase 2 during expiration in a patient, however, what happens in this particular part of time would be that there would be an increase in peripheral vascular resistance. I'll repeat that again for phase 1. I said phase 1, iota is getting oppressed. Phase 2, the venous return is becoming less. Now, with respect to the late part of phase 2, what is happening is that there is going to be an increase in the peripheral resistance. And this increase in peripheral resistance will contribute to a slow increase. It would not be a fast. It would be at a slower rate. It's a slower rate increase in the blood pressure of a patient. This slow rate of increase of blood pressure will not be providing a sufficient stimulus for the baroreceptors to respond. You see, baroreceptors will respond to a particular strength of a stimulus. In phase 2 late, because there is a slow increase, in the peripheral resistance, the BP is beginning to rise, but it is not sufficient to cause the bare receptors to respond. So what you will notice in the patient will be that the heart rate of the patient will not start decreasing. 
please pay attention to the fact that in the entire discussion that I'll be having before you, whatever will be the direction of arrow of the blood pressure, the heart rate direction will be opposite to it. It will always be opposite to it. But here what you can see is, especially for phase 2 late, what you can notice is that because there is a slower rate of increase of blood pressure, the threshold for stimulation for the beta receptors is not being achieved as a result of which the heart rate of the patient is not showing a decrease. And let's look at now what happens with respect to phase 3. In phase 3 what he says is that there will be increase in the capacitance of the pulmonary bed. Now if you just focus on the English word increase in capacitance of the pulmonary bed, the lungs will be receiving or lungs will be containing more blood because the with the vasculature of the veins, pulmonary veins are getting dilated. So again, the blood which is going to the heart will be relatively lesser. And if the input to the heart is lesser, the BP will again begin to fall. And this would be associated with an increase in heart rate of a patient. As I've told you, you don't need to cram up the heart rate. Just try to focus on the blood pressure values. Before I go to the fourth phase, which is the most critical one, let's revise this once again. In phase 1, I said there is aortic compression that is explaining the increase of blood pressure. But in phase 2 early part, what I was saying was that there will be a decrease in the venous return to the heart. The reason for this would be increased intrathoracic pressure. And in phase 2 late, there is an increase in peripheral resistance. That is where the BP tends to increase slightly, but not sufficient enough for causing that threshold of receptor activation to occur. In phase 3, subsequently, you have increase in capacitors of the pulmonary vessels. So, the blood pressure is again going to fall because the blood is going to remain in the lungs. And phase 4, I can say, is more of a compensatory phase that there would be a persistent vasoconstriction. Phase 4 is important because if phase 4 is going to be uh, not present, that means that sympathomimetic system is not functioning in a patient because if you want a persistent vasoconstriction to be present, you need a properly functioning sympathomimetic system. And at this point of time, if there's a vasoconstriction, the blood pressure of the patient will again begin to rise and the heart rate of the patient will begin to reduce. They use the word compensatory bradycardia in phase 4. Why that compensatory bradycardia will occur in phase 4 is mainly because of the opposite change in the heart rate with respect to the increase in the blood pressure. So, at the moment, what I've told you is mainly physiology with respect to uh, the Velsawa response. And over and above this, I will also be talking about Velsawa uh, ratio. And Velsawa ratio basically means maximum phase 2 tachycardia. Let me go back to the slide. Uh, I did explain to you that in patients who are having phase 2, there will be a tachycardia present both in the early phase as well as in the late phase. The reasons I've explained to you why it is increasing even in the late phase because the threshold of receptor stimulation is not being achieved. So we are going to take in the numerator, the maximum heart rate recorded in phase 2 and in the denominator, we're going to take into consideration the bradycardia component that will come and this is going to be what is called as Vansawa ratio. Now, suppose, suppose in a patient, if the sympathomimetic system is damaged, then this tachycardia will not occur. And the tachycardia will not occur, then this ratio will begin to fall. So, Vensawa ratio, uh, if it is on the lower side, it basically tells you the fact that the sympathomimetic system in the patient will be hampered. Or, in other words, the language written in the MCU can be, he can write it like this, abnormal blood pressure responses. Abnormality in blood pressure, abnormal BP recordings in phase 2 late. Added phase 4. You mainly need to remember to late phase and phase 4. Abnormalities of blood pressure in phase 2 and phase 4. In phase 4, I told you there is a persistent vasoconstriction. BP should be rising. If it's not rising, it's a problem. The sympathomimetic system would be affected in this patient. It's usually written in books as phase 4 overshoot. That overshoot basically means that there is a compensatory mechanism of peripheral vasoconstriction occurring in a person. So, abnormalities in BP in phase 2 late or phase 4 indicates a sympathomimetic malfunction in a patient or an adrenergic dysfunction. In the exam, it is unlikely that he will go into the physiology component, though he can. Uh, the minimum I expect you to remember with respect to Vilsawa uh, response that I explained to you is this particular part from the lower, I mean the slow rate aspect that I told you for the late phase of uh, phase 2 when there's an expiration occurring in a patient. Phase 3 would be end of expiration, then there's a compensatory response occurring. So, we have talked about heart rate variation with deep breathing, then we have talked about uh, Vensawa ratio and a Vensawa response. And next on the focus would be uh, aspects related to sweating, that is pseudomotor function. 
and for this we are having two tests available one is called as QSARD that is quantitative pseudo water axon reflex test which would basically mean acetylcholine induced sweating you very well know that post ganglionic fibers related to sweating would be acetylcholine will be but the pre ganglionic fibers are anyway acetylcholine the post ganglionic fibers are also acetylcholine based so QSARD test basically tests the post ganglionic system then there's another one which is called as thermoregulatory sweat test in which we'll be putting a special powder on the body of a patient and this would change color if the person is having sweating let me say in response to change in ambient temperature like for example if the person is in a hot environment if the person takes a sauna bath for example then in a hot environment there would be a lot of sweating occurring so thermoregulatory sweat test basically is going to test about uh, the response of the body to increase in ambient temperature uh, that's about global sweat production whereas the quantitative pseudo water axon test or QSARD this uh, axon reflex test this basically is going to test only the post ganglionic segment the next test that I'll be doing in this patient would be to test about the function of sweating that is pseudo water test there are two of them that are available one of them is called as QSARD that is uh, uh, that would be a quantitative pseudo motor axon reflex test second would be a thermoregulatory sweat test the QSAR test is mainly going to be for post ganglionic pseudomotor drive. You know the pre ganglionic fibers related to sweating are acetylcholine based. The post ganglionic fibers related to sweating are also acetylcholine based. So QSAR test mainly is going to test the post ganglionic drive related to sweating. When it comes to thermoregulatory sweat test, this would be more of a global response to a global response to elevation of body temperature. Like if a person takes a uh, if person is sitting in a sauna bath then uh, due to exposure to heat there would be extensive perspiration or sweating occurring in a patient so that global response of the body to increase the body temperature is what is measured by a thermoregulatory sweat test that's written as TST and if you want to check out only the post ganglionic uh, arm with respect to sweating then it's QSART now if there's a post ganglionic lesion what's going to happen is that the QSART in the patient will be negative that is quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test will be negative and at the same time, the thermoregulatory sweat test will also be negative. Why? Because if the post ganglionic arm is hampered, then even if the person is exposed to heat, because after all, sweating is all related to the post ganglionic drive. If the final effect, if the final effective part of the highway is not there, cars cannot arrive on that or cannot reach, reach their final target, which is why both test negative means it is a post ganglionic defect. But if it's going to be a pre-ganglionic defect occurring in a patient, then the post-ganglionic test will be turn on, turning out to be normal. I told you QSART, the quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test, measures only and only the post-ganglionic part related to sweating. If there's a pre-ganglionic damage, then this QSART test would be normal in a person. But at the same time, when it comes to a thermoregulatory sweat test, there can be two possibilities depending on the amount of damage. Either the amount of sweat produced will be relatively low, or there might be complete absence of sweating that might increase the body temperature of the patient on exposure to heat to disproportionately high levels that is due to anhydrosis. You will notice hyperhydrosis causes smaller body temperature. If there is anhydrosis, the body temperature of a person can rise. The main concept, I think the easiest way to remember is simply one statement of mine that QSART is going to test the post ganglionic arm related to sweating which is acetylcholine based. Every time there's a post ganglionic fiber, past post ganglionic is the effector pathway. It's the final pathway. I mean, it's 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 just reaching the destination. If that effector pathway is gone, then there would be no sweating, whether you expose the person to heat or whether you are testing only the post ganglionic arm per se. So both tests will turn out to be negative. Part number four or five that I'll be describing before you are mainly for the tilt table test, where we'll take into consideration orthostatic BP recordings in a patient, which means that a beat to beat variation or beat to beat blood pressure measurements will be taken when the patient is in supine position then at a 70 degree tilt then a 70 degree tilt back as well and similarly i mean what is the advantage of doing a head up tilt it might be written as hut that the advantage of doing this heart test is mainly to reproduce the symptoms of syncope in a patient and we can actually rule out the possibility of psychogenic syncope as well the patient will be kept supine for approximately 20 minutes then we will raise up the head end of the uh, of the hospital bed the patient will be properly restrained to the hospital bed in these uh, while, while doing the proper testing and the angle to which the person might be elevated might be as high as about 70 degrees the patient will be kept in this position for about 20 to 45 minutes to check for whether he develops a syncope or not and i mean this test very accurately reproduces manifestations of a syncope 
in if there is a genuine syncope occurring due to orthostatic hypotension you will notice that within 20 to 45 minutes a patient being kept in this position syncope will occur if it does not occur i'm not saying it's 100 percent accurate but then most of the time uh the the possibility of at least neurogenic or, or or i can say the neurogenic cause for development of orthostatic hypotension can be safely ruled out so these are couple of autonomic tests which we are doing for evaluation of our patients who are having dysautonomia